Have you ever taken one of those survival exams where you're presented with a list of all kinds of equipment, like you know, sleeping bag, lighter, food, water, matches, magnifying glass, and so on, and they say, okay, you're stranded in the desert. What five things do you most want to survive in the desert? I usually do very poorly on those exams. However, if there was such an exam for a network technician and they said, okay, here's 50 different technologies, choose the five that are most uh, relevant to your job, that essentially you need to survive in networking. I would say VLANs, and can I be bold in saying this, VLANs would make number two on my list. Seriously, right after the IP protocol, IP protocol, number one, you got to know it. VLANs are right there because they are so pervasive in the network world. They are literally everywhere from wireless segmentation to separating servers from, from uh, guest network, from uh, typical employees to the service rider environment, separating customers from each other. I mean, VLANs are everywhere they saturate the network world so in this nugget I'm not only going to give you the core VLAN concepts and show you what VLANs are but I really want to go practical on you because that's one of the things I found is I can explain VLANs all day and people are like oh I, I see that you'll see what in a moment, moment what I mean when I say I see the colors that make sense but until you actually see some practical examples especially how they relate to a service provider environment uh, sometimes it can be a little bit vague here are your do I know this already questions, so if you already know all the concepts, feel free to move right along. Before we can get into how VLANs work, we need to have a base understanding of how normal switching works. First off, normal switching, major improvement from the hub days, right? A hub being a device where everybody sees everybody, so when this guy wants to speak to this guy over here on the hub, uh, everybody sees that communication, these spying eyes in the middle with Wireshark open. So the, a normal switch offers some separation because it has multiple collision domains. So if host A wants to communicate to host C over here, they can do that without bothering host B in the middle. That's good. However, a switch breaks down, if, if we can use it uh, in that sense, when we look at the broadcast domain. In plain English, a broadcast domain defines how far a broadcast goes before it's stopped. A switch, and connected to another switch, and another switch, and another switch, will always have one broadcast domain. That is, when one of these devices send a broadcast, whether it be for a DHCP request, whether it's trying to look around for other services that are available, I mean, broadcast can be all kinds of things. Essentially, that switch receives it and sends it out all ports, including the uplink, when they send it out all ports, and they send it out all ports. It's one of the biggest constraining factors in our networks today to say, well, the more devices we have, the more broadcasts we have saturating our networks, and eventually you reach a point where just by plugging in a network cable, you can slow a device down because because it's processing all these broadcasts, not to mention the saturation it does for a network and security ramifications, because everybody can quote unquote reach everybody. All you have to have is somebody with malicious intent, or sometimes even not so malicious intent, they just don't know what they're doing, uh, running an IP scan, and you're able to see everybody else on the same subnet as you. So that's one of the key facts, a normal switch operates in a single subnet mode, meaning when I connect switches together, all these switches and devices attached will all be the same subnet. So we'll just say this is 192.168.1.0 slash 24. Uh, all the devices plugged in will start with 192.168.1 because they're all part of the same network. This also represents one failure domain, meaning if you end up with a loop in the network or, and loop, loop is a bad, I, bad uh, call, uh, let's say a rogue DHCP server, right? This is something that takes down networks all the time, where you have a DHCP server that wasn't in intended, handing out IP addresses from 172.16.1. Well, you're on this subnet, it's handing out the wrong addresses. You have computers dropping off the network like flies as they get these addresses from the wrong DHCP scope. That's what I mean when I say one failure domain. Essentially, you have one uh, piece of fabric that extends through the entire network. And I've already mentioned, this provides big security ramifications because people can see each other. Now, I wasn't planning to get practical on the slide, but since I added this to the bottom, I have to for just a moment. VLANs allow you to very easily configure quality of service, meaning I can create a subnet, a VLAN of devices, we'll just call, let's just say the blue ones, and I can then go to a device further down the road, let's say it's a router that's connected to a WAN link where the bandwidth is limited, uh, I can go in there and say, well, you know, at all times, all cases, the blue VLAN gets the priority over the... Uh, red VLAN, right? Uh, and it's very easy to do that. Whereas if you did not have VLANs, it's very difficult to identify devices from each other because they're all part of the same mush. 
So now as I describe VLANs, I'm going to start off with the foundations. Keep in mind, I'm not going to really talk practical at this point. I'm just talking about how it functions. VLANs logically group users. How does it do that? Well, what you do is you go in and create a VLAN. In this example, I'll say that we have a red and a blue VLAN. Uh, that I have represented here. Now, in the world of VLANs, you always use a VLAN number. The name is optional, but you have to have the number. So, you know, maybe blue equals VLAN 2 and red equals VLAN 3, right? So, draw those lines over. So, in this case, I go into the switch and manually configure the ports as to which VLAN they belong in. Now, this is me and you as a administrator go into the switch and we say okay port fast ethernet 0 slash 1 is in VLAN 2 the blue VLAN fast ethernet 0 slash 2 is in the blue VLAN so we manually assign each one of those ports to that you know this fast ethernet 0 slash 3 is in VLAN 3 the red VLAN and so on and so forth so I keep assigning these now what I've done when I, when I assign these things in the VLAN, if I could mentally uh, have you envision a switch with a bunch of ports like this, if I, if I say, okay, these two are blue and these two are red, it would be as if I did a, a ninja karate chop, yeah, snap, and, and broke that switch over my knee, and I now have two separate switches, one for the red VLAN and one for the blue VLAN. And that would completely separate them from each other, right? And their functional devices. And the same kind of thing here. So when this guy sends a broadcast, let's just say it's an ARP message, another type of broadcast. I want to know who is, you know, 10.1.1.1. That's a, a typical ARP message. That would come out all the blue ports, travel down here, all these blue ports, and yes, it does transcend switches, so it, it flows all the way down, and then out all, oop, er. <laughs> Broken switch, non-Cisco. Uh, we've got another blue port down here where it gets the broadcast, right? So it, it completely segments the broadcast domains to where now our switches have multiple broadcast domains. Now, uh, one other key fact before I, I add another twist to this, subnet correlation. When I first learned VLANs, I remember seeing something on Cisco's website, I can't find it, I looked, uh, where they had written down, they said VLAN equals a broadcast domain equals a subnet. Right? They made that correlation, and I, I scratched my head for a long time going, what does that mean? It means they're all really the same thing with different names applied to them. When I create the red VLAN, I create another broadcast domain. So all the red, v all the red broadcasts stay in the red broadcast, right? Uh, I create another subnet to where if the blue VLAN used to be you know, 10.1.1.0 slash 24, then the red VLAN has to be something else. It can't be 10.1.1.0. It'd be 10.1.2.0 slash 24, right? Um, so I'm trying to think which nugget of wisdom to add at this point. Uh, okay, so let me, let me go here. Uh, what if the red VLAN wants to get to the blue VLAN? Like this guy wants to talk to this guy. Can we do it? No. <laughs> I know some of you are like, but wait, I thought you... No. Uh, looking at this picture right here, which I will say is represented by a whole bunch of... Here's the key fact. Layer 2, meaning normal, mere mortal switches. Right? These are normal switches. You do not have what's known as routing between the VLANs. The red cannot get to the blue, and the blue cannot get to the red. You have, in a way, completely segmented them from each other, which is phenomenal for access control. Uh, not so good if you want that kind of communication, but it, it's possible. And the beauty is, is you can then filter it. I can say, well, the red VLAN can access the blue VLAN, but whoa, just a second. Only on port 80. Right? which means it can only uh, only do web surfing or something like that over to the other side, HTTP, or only, you know, you just see what I mean, right? Or only to this one guy at 10.1.1.50. No one else is allowed. Um, okay, so, so uh, another key fact. Let me wipe this clean for a second. Uh, I mentioned that if the blue VLAN sends a broadcast, it comes out all the blue ports, and if the red VLAN sends a broadcast, it comes out all the red ports, right? Okay. What VLAN is that a member of? I know, I know. Hang on. I, what? Okay, yes, sir, in the back. No, I'm sorry. You're. Com <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes, all of them, right? Uh, or, I mean, if you said both of them, all of them, you are absolutely right because those are known in the Cisco land as trunk ports. Okay, super MVP concept right here. When a packet comes into the switch, let's just say we've got this blue guy that sends a ping, right? Uh, to 
Well, let's just, let's just do an art message. A lot easier, right? A broadcast. So it's not directed to anyone. It's a broadcast. Comes in. The switch takes that. You know, here's the packet, right? With all of its header information, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm a broadcast. I'm an ARP uh, message. And it takes its blue pen and says, this guy is blue, right? This is known as a tag. Now, a switch is the only thing, well, uh, and I'll say there's exception to this rule, but the only thing that really understands tags. Like, if this, if this computer received a packet, if this actually made it down to here, and it left that little blue header on the front, this guy would think this is a bad packet. He'd say, whoa, hey, what, what's this junk in the header? It must be a bad packet. I'm going to discard it. So a tag is never allowed to reach the end devices. So, for instance, when this guy sends an ARP, let's imagine we had a whole bunch of blue computers right there. But, you know, the switch colors it, but before it goes out, any port that connects to an end computer, it will actually remove that tag, you know, if I could exit out, remove that tag uh, from it, so this guy just sees an ARP. Here, can I, can I give you a key fact? Computers never know what VLAN they're on. It's true. All they know is I have an IP address, I'm just communicating, it's a happy day in computer paradise. They never know which VLAN they're actually on. VLANs is a switch concept. It's a network superstar concept. It's nothing to do with the computers itself. Same thing with the, the red one. When it sends a, a uh, ARP message, it's going to get the little uh, red uh, color or tag on the front of it, which is never sent to an end computer. But... When it goes across these special ports known as trunk ports, it keeps them on. Meaning, as this art message comes to this one, it's configured as a trunk port, and the switch goes, oh, okay, I'll keep that tag on there. So when it gets down to switch two right here, switch two goes, oh, okay, looking at the tag, I see exactly what you're talking about. I'm going to send it to this guy because he's part of the red VLAN. I saw that VLAN uh, three tag on there, so I'll, I'll send that. But of course, before it sends it out here, it does what with it? Removes it, right? Yanks the tag off there. Then it sends it down here, but keeps the tag on when it sends it out to this one. Any trunk port, it keeps the tag on there. Now, I will say there's very few things where I, I admit that other vendors do it better. I think this is one of them. Trunk is a Cisco term. You very rarely hear trunk in the industry outside of dealing with Cisco switches. Everybody else in the industry calls them tagged ports. And when you hear my description, it's like, oh, 